This is the Maternity and Midwifery Hour with Andy Shannon and Caitlin Wilson exploring preeclampsia. And I'm very delighted to introduce Caitlin Wilson, who's a consultant midwife at Worcester Acute Hospitals NHS Trust. Um, and before she took on this role, she'd led the development and opening of new, two new birth centres in Yorkshire, the reconfiguration of hospital services. And she's had lots of different ex um, positions in London and Yorkshire, including consultant midwife, community matron, clinical uh, placement facilita facilitator, and caseload team leader. Her key areas of expertise and interest are choice of birth place for all women, with the emphasis on MLUs, midwifery led units, and home birth leadership and mentorship, feedback, and continue, con continue to a carer. So I think that the the floor is yours, Caitlin. Oh. Thank you very much. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And Andrew, what a wonderful talk. So uh, what my presentation is going to be about is to look a little bit about the impact that COVID has had on midwifery services, maternity services, but with particular emphasis on midwifery services, and how our antenatal care, which Andrew has alluded to, um, has been impacted by that and how we are mitigating the risks for women who may potentially have um, symptoms of preeclampsia or be at risk of preeclampsia are being monitored and handled out in our community, um, our community services and our antenatal clinics, whilst we also um, mitigate um, any other risks with COVID-19. And so I'm just going to start with kind of the, the big picture. And um, as we know, COVID-19 has created challenges for health services all over the globe. And the UK, although, as Andrew said, has been um, quite hard hit um, and the challenges have been there for our health services, um, it is across the globe and, and we need to recognise that. And maternity services has, has gone on. And, and Sue said right at the beginning, you know, although places were able to or the hospitals were able to um, move things around and trend, you know, cancel appointments that weren't necessary, such as elective, um, elective surgeries and those types of things, um, and moving them later into the service, which has its own public health issues, of course, and its own, its own risks that we need, to, we need to start looking at and mitigating. Um, for maternity services, we have had to carry on. You know, nothing has changed and the babies, babies are coming, mums need care, and, and we have had to continue our delivery of our services um, very much at the, at the quotas that they were before. But what it has done is it has created some redesign and redesignation of maternity services. So things we've had to be very agile in response to COVID-19 and how we have been able to both redesign our services and redesignate services into, into what we would call green areas, um, where it is a lower risk for, for women making contact with wider communities who may be carrying COVID. So that has been something that the service has worked really quickly for. Um, and lots of services have been doing that across the country to ensure the safety of mums and babies. And we also have the challenge to ensure that care is delivered differently, but it's also safe and effective and in line with what both women-centered care and baby-centered care. And we have to remember that at the center of all of this and the philosophy of maternity services, services is that women and babies are at the center of what we do. And as Andrew alluded to, you know, we cannot um, have COVID overshadowing other significant health issues um, which may be out there, um, which are maybe more likely for women to be experiencing than COVID. Whilst we are mindful of COVID-19, we certainly need to be aware that there are other um, conditions that we need to be monitoring women for um, as effectively and as safely as we did before, even where services may be slightly different in how they're actually delivered. So we need to ensure that our staff, staff are all safe when they're providing this care. Um, and we also tasked with assessing and evaluating and responding to this very dynamic situation and the clinical needs of women in new ways. And I will get onto a little bit more of kind of the local um, picture as has been happening in our local area and how we've responded to, to this virus. And we need to continue to ensure that women have information and knowledge to access services when they're needed. And we've been doing an awful lot of work um, with our local communities to make sure that they still understand that our services are open. Maternity services are open and we still are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week for things like reduced fetal movements. Um, and if you're feeling unwell, any of the signs and symptoms that you may be having um, with blood pressure or any issue whatsoever. So just to give you a little bit of context about the same changes at our local level, because I don't think we are unique in the, in the experiences that we've been having. 
like most places, we haven't been as hard hit as London has, but we certainly have had um, COVID. Um, and so throughout the UK, different areas are experiencing things at different times. You know, London is now seeing a decline. And as I see that there's been no, no reported new cases today. Um, and so that's, you know, London is seeing a shift, whereas we know in the Northwest, um, things are starting to change there. So different places in the UK are experiencing COVID at a different time. And so for us locally in the West Midlands here, the antenatal care in our clinics and community has changed in response to COVID-19, how we've been delivering care. Um, we have responded initially as all organizations did in scaling back of the antenatal care. However, most of our services have resumed as normal in the sense that we have been doing following um, the nice guidelines of clinical checks. Um, and a few of our um, visits are done remotely, but we certainly have a lot of contact with our women and whilst we're trying to keep women out of the buildings as much as possible, where it is appropriate to do so, um, we're certainly having lots of face-to-face, -face, um, FaceTime um, sessions with women. And you know, it's not FaceTime, but it's obviously on a secured platform. But I think most people will know what I mean when they say FaceTime. And having those type of video chats um, with women to ensure that they're safe and that the, the midwives are able to see women um, as well and get a good picture from them. And actually I had a conversation with a lot of our community midwives today in preparation for this, but what their experiences have really been like for this. And, and they're finding that they're able to spend a little bit more time talking to women um, and on the face to, on the telephone conversations and are actually really able to do deep dives into histories and get some good responses from women and able to marry that up with the previous clinical notes. So that, that is still going on. And as Andrew alluded to, you know, that certainly is important so that we get women into the right services at the right time. Um, so that if they do have a history of preeclampsia or may develop preeclampsia for their various risks um, that they may be having, that that is done in a very timely manner. And so that is continuing. And that is certainly something that we have been very responsive to um, throughout this crisis is that women are still being very, very strongly risk assessed and, and being accessed in, accessing our services quite quickly. So monitoring of urine and blood pressure, and we are beginning um, to try and do that remotely. Again, we're going to target as with the RCOG recommendations and the RCM recommendations about who that should be. But like Andy said, <laughs> you know, there are there is certainly um, getting a hold of equipment is, is somewhat of an issue. But we are we are working on that as an organization. And I know lots of other places throughout the country are doing that. Um, and I've been speaking to consultant midwife colleagues and heads of midwifery. And so risk assessment and clinical need is responded to as appropriate. And so again, our community midwives and our midwives and clinics, they are still doing business as usual. They are still assessing women a day in and day out to make sure that they are accessing the appropriate care at the appropriate time in the appropriate environment for them. And that includes blood pressure and, and urinalysis and everything that we need to keep on top of of diseases like preeclampsia. Um, and that has not gone away. That has been in the forefront of our minds that this is something that we really need to need to make sure um, is appropriately, appropriately managed. And again, for all the reasons that was, was mentioned in the previous presentation. And so continuity of care, um, our continuity of care can, teams have continued um, and our community midwives and our clinical midwives have been offering as much continuity of care as they possibly can. And again, this is a one way to not only reduce the stress and the mental health experiences of our family and our women, um, but also for that early recognition and that open communication. So where women may not be feeling well and may dismiss it because they don't want to come into the facility because of COVID, at least those more um, honest conversations can happen or they feel a little bit more um, trusting or whatever the words might be um, for, that, for that relationship. Um, we have tried to keep that going as much as possible um, and, and are seeing an increase in that. And that really is helping to support our women and our families locally. And although postnatal care, um, and again, we do know that some women can develop uh, preeclampsia postnatally, uh, we are delivering care slightly differently in that there is a few more face, uh, non-face-to-face visits um, and telephone conversations with women. That is also heavily risk assessed. And that means that when these when women are discharged from our hospitals or our home births or any facilities that, they, that they've had their babies in, the midwives are still communicating with each other effectively as to whether this woman has experienced blood pressure issues in her, in her pregnancy or birth experience, or whether or not she did have a preeclampsia um, suspicion or confirmed, and we are responding appropriately. And those women are having increased surveillance as you would expect. Um, even in non-COVID times. So really we are continuing to, to look after women as the most appropriate way um, that the clinical risk suggests. 
So just some of our progress and our observations. Um, locally, we have been really highly involved with our MVP. Um, my director of midwifery has been doing questions and answer sessions, and I know that this has been replicated up and down the country. Um, and it's an excellent um, conduit for communication with our, with our communities. And this is to reassure women what, what's happening with the COVID situation, but it's also to reassure women that our, that our facilities are open and that they can access 24 hour service, be that through the telephone lines and through our triage systems, and that we are still making sure that women have access to those services. And that is a message that's being reiterated over and over and over again. And the MVP, our Maternity Voices Partnership has provided an excellent um, gauge as to what, um, what the community is feeling around COVID-19 and accessing our services. And so we've been able to put out the communications as appropriate. So they have been, they have been absolutely excellent in, in helping to, um, to mitigate the care. So reduce fetal movement, um, feeling unwell, uh, any of those issues um, that would lead to suggestive of preeclampsia or, or any other maternal issues or fetal issues, um, we are certainly highlighting those over and over again. So classes and sessions, we're offering those through online platforms and that again is being echoed up and down the country. Um, and these are an opportunity not only to give women information about pregnancy, labor, birth and the postnatal period, but it's also an opportunity for us to reiterate that our services are open, to reiterate signs and symptoms of possible preeclampsia and other maternal conditions uh, or fetal conditions that uh, mothers need to be mindful for and making contact with their services. So it is really making every contact count and that Brussels, we are continuing with our robust assessment of conditions um, and really focusing on preeclampsia. And that has some, been something which has helped to achieve that number of one in a million. And we plan to do so throughout this and beyond. Um, triage and day units opened, and we've been doing that with um, social support, um, social distancing support, um, and ensuring that women um, feel confident in our services that we are able to mitigate the COVID-19 situation for them. And also like ourselves, we've been able to keep our home birth service open um, and information about home birth has certainly increased. And I know a lot of my colleagues have been echoing that up and down the country. And we are continuing to work with, with our communities um, to do risk assessments and making sure that women give birth in the appropriate environment um, for them. And where there may be a suspicion of preeclampsia or blood pressure issues, we are encouraging women to, to birth in our hospitals where appropriate. And I just wanted to say thank you. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of an overview and to really contextualize what Andy was saying, what Andrew was saying with, um, with the services. And, and I hope that's been helpful for you. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.